Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight for our um, information session on Temple University's major in industrial and systems engineering. It is our newest major. Um, we are recording this session, so if you need to refer back to it at any point, we'll be posting this to our website when we're all said and done. Um, and it looks like we'll have a few more students joining us um, throughout uh, the rest of the presentation, but I just wanted to get started um, and not uh, take up any more of your time. But you'll uh, be able to ask uh, questions of our faculty participants and our student participants. Um, so we're happy that you're joining us tonight to learn more about this major. So just some quick introductions on who's on the, uh, on the Zoom tonight. So myself, my name is Colleen Bailey. I'm the Director of Enrollment Management for Temple's College of Engineering. And we're also joined by Dr. Julie Drzmalski, who is a professor of instruction and the director of the industrial and systems engineering major, and Claire, who's a sophomore student in the major, and you'll have the opportunity to hear from them um, in just a little bit. So just real quickly, I want to give a background um, sort of about Temple Engineering and about um, the ISC major. So Temple's College of Engineering was founded in 1969, so we just celebrated our 50th year, which is very exciting. And we have a little over 1,700 students total, so about 1,500 undergraduates and 187 graduate students. Um, depending on the size of your high school, that uh, total number might sound small to you, it might sound large. But when you compare the College of Engineering to some of the other schools and colleges at Temple, like for example, the business school, we're one of the smaller colleges, and that brings along with it a lot of benefits to you, which I'll touch on in just a little bit. Um, the undergraduate population is about 25% female, which is above the national average in engineering. The national average, I believe, is usually around 21-22%, so we have a nice expanding female population within the college, which is exciting. Um, and we also have a very diverse student body as well. About 37% of our students identify as non-white, and we also have students that come to us throughout the globe. About 136 um, international students are um, studying their undergraduate program with us. So the new major in industrial system engineering or ISE for short, um, we had our first class that started in fall of 2018. So our um, second class just started um, this past fall and will be, if you're interested in fall 2021 admission, you'll be the third class coming in. Um, it's part of our new department of engineering technology and management. And currently we have 40 total students that are in the major. Um, you can see here um, the sort of the gender and um, ethnicity breakdown kind of mimics the um, total college, so we're a little bit of, ahead of um, the college as a whole with uh, male-female enrollment, um, and same with our diversity as well, and we also have international students that are studying in the major as well. So in terms of why you should consider Temple for your engineering education, for one, part of Temple's mission is that it offers um, a very high quality education, regardless of your major, whether it's in engineering, liberal arts, business, at an affordable cost, and that's very important because higher education is getting increasingly expensive, but Temple's um, part of, core to Temple's mission is making sure that your education stays affordable. And that's again, very important. As I mentioned before, we have um, a highly diverse student body as well as our faculty. And that meet, that's both within the College of Engineering as well as throughout the um, university as a whole. And by studying at a place like Temple, you'll not only encounter engineering students, but again, as I mentioned before, business students, architecture students, art, music, being at a large university like Temple exposes you to many different types of people studying many different things. And it's very important in engineering, especially in the industrial and systems engineering major, which is so interdisciplinary. And um, Dr. Drzmalski will be talking about that in just a little bit. We also have our own in-house team of academic advisors and career counselors. They um, are there to make sure that you're on the right track to graduate, that you're selecting the right classes, but they're also um, there for you to make sure you're got the right plan in place for after you leave us after four years. Um, so they offer everything from resume reviews to mock interviews. They can help set students up with internship experiences. Um, and our students are very successful in getting some internships. And we also offer some cooperative learning opportunities as well. Um, because we're one of the smaller um, colleges at Temple University, there's a number of opportunities to participate in faculty research. We have a highly accessible faculty. Um, we have a little over 70 faculty and you can get involved in faculty research as early as your freshman year. At many schools and colleges of engineering, that typically doesn't happen until you're at least a junior or senior, if at all. They're, they tend to be, again, very large, larger colleges and um, the priority is more on the graduate students as opposed to undergraduates. But as I mentioned before, again, being one of the smaller colleges at Temple, you really get the best of both worlds. So you have all the benefits of being in a smaller environment with access to faculty um, and access to research opportunities and other mentorship opportunities, but all of the benefits of being at a large urban research university by 
um, exposure to all these different academic majors and different students, different student activities, being in a great city like Philadelphia. So there's a number of opportunities that are available to you as a Temple engineering student. Um, and Claire will go into sort of what she's involved in in a little bit, but we also have a very active student body within the College of Engineering. We have about 16 student um, professional organizations, and these are academically based. Like for example, for the um, ISD students, they are part of the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers. But these um, professional societies, you can join them regardless of major. So for example, if you also have an interest in civil engineering, you could join ASCE, which is the American Society of Civil Engineers, or vice versa. You don't have to necessarily be female to join the Society of Women Engineers. So we encourage our students to get involved in as many different organizations as possible because this will open up a lot of opportunities for professional development. Um, you might have the opportunity to attend conferences. So, um, and in all my years working in higher education, I found that the best students are the ones that get involved. So definitely take advantage of the student organizations that are available, not just at the College of Engineering, but also at Temple as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Drzmowski to talk a little bit more in depth about the major. Thanks, Colleen. Um, first, I just wanted to say welcome. I'm glad you're interested in industrial and systems engineering. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of overview about myself and then talk a lot about what industrial and systems engineering is and what you're going to study if you were to choose that major um, and where it could take you. Uh, so um, I, my bachelor's is in mechanical engineering and uh, working in construction and construction management. And so that originally from New York, but that allowed me to live in about 10 states. Um, and so it was interesting, but what I felt was that my career was really limited. Um, I felt very locked into uh, the construction industry and in particular the job role that I had in, in program management. And so I went back to school and uh, as I like to say, I saw the light and uh, majored in industrial and systems engineering. And that allowed me to actually do research globally um, and visit about 13 countries, um, which was a lot of fun. Uh, so now um, industrial and systems engineering is my passion and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what it is and what we do. Uh, next slide. So in general, um, industrial and systems engineering allows you the opportunity to work in virtually any industry that you're interested in. Um, I like to say that we design, improve, and optimize processes and systems. And so those systems can include people, equipment, materials, information. They're all different depending on what industry you're in and they all have incorporate different things. Um, but the, the tools that you will learn as an industrial and systems engineer and the tool, toolbox that you have when you graduate will allow you to go into virtually any industry. Next slide. So I very often get asked, what exactly is it that we do? And so rather than just kind of um, give you an overview of uh, what we do and, and kind of the, um, the nuts and bolts of it, I thought I would, the best way to do that would be to give you some examples of projects that I'm either working on now or have worked on in the past to give you an idea. And they have been all over the board, um, just to give you an idea of the kind of things that we do. Next slide. So uh, healthcare. So healthcare happens to be um, one of my passions. And I really um, feel very strongly about trying to improve our healthcare systems processes. But one of the first projects that I worked on, um, and this is with, uh, these projects, by the way, are all with students that I did. Um, one of these first projects, one of the first projects I ever did was at a hospital in Western Massachusetts. And um, we went in and we just sort of talked to the doctors and the nurses in the emergency department. So their emergency department wasn't really running very smoothly, you might say. And so we went in and um, we were called in to sort of, you know, kind of help them out with no real concrete um, information about what was really wrong. And so one of the things that we heard over and over and over was that the doctors and nurses in the emergency department were really struggling to, they, they felt that they never had the right equipment. Whenever, if you've ever been in an emergency room, um, you know, there's, there's your little bed and then there's usually a bedside, um, like a little cabinet. 
and that houses some supplies, but they're very small and because there's not a lot of room. And what they felt was that every time they went to get something, it was never there. There were always the wrong things in the cabinets. And so, you know, it was driving them crazy. And so that necessitated extra time. They'd have to go back to the storeroom, get what they needed. And so they said, can, you know, like, let's just help you out here. So next slide. So we have, so we, we observed for a while. Um, and if you think about an emergency room there, it's very small and this bedside cabinet is also very small and there's lots of different projects. I mean, if you think about products rather, uh, if you think about all of the potential issues people can be in an emergency room for, you know, there's so many different products that you might need and different sizes even of the same product. And it's a very small space. So one of the things you learn as an industrial and systems engineer is inventory management. And so you learn how to analyze demand and you learn how to then optimize what you should have. So this happens to be a very small instance, right? So we have a very small space. So what should we put in there and when should we replenish it so that we minimize number one, the risk to the patient, because if you need something very quick um, and you don't have it, you know, and you have to, uh, spend extra time going to a storeroom to get it, you're putting the patient at risk. Um, so we reduce the risk to the patient, we increase the satisfaction of the uh, nurses and the physicians. Um, and so we did this by observing, um, looking at data, and then we had to do some optimization. So we learn um, inventory management, we learn how to optimize space. Um, so those are just some of the things um, that you'll learn, but also one of the applications. Now, I also still work in healthcare, but now I'm working to improve healthcare systems in terms of doing some research in terms of trying, now, if you think about the large healthcare system, just trying to figure out how um, we can look at it from a systems, per systems perspective and try to figure out how to best, um, we're, we're looking at medication adherence. So how, from a large scale perspective, how can we get people to take their medication? Because that is one of the largest um, costs of healthcare is that people don't make, take their medication and it has all sorts of ramifications. So we're looking at it from a systems perspective and trying to analyze that. So going from a very small application to a very broad perspective, um, but that's healthcare. So let me give you a couple more examples. So, Sports. Uh, maybe you've seen Money Pit, uh, Money Ball. Sorry, with Brad Pitt. Um, so in Money Ball, if you haven't seen it, um, Billy Bean had to build the Brad Pitt had to build uh, the best roster he could. Um, it was based on a true story, uh, and it's about sports analytics. Basically, you have a very limited budget, and you want to build the best roster that you can. So you can. I mean, you could think about this was about baseball, but obviously you can think about um, any sport, right? They have to build a roster. They have very limited, um, very, they have a limited budget. Um, and so this can apply to anything. And they have other constraints about, you know, what players, what kinds of players that they need, what kind of players that they don't need, um, who should they trade, who should they not trade. So lots of different applications. Uh, next slide. So if you think about just for example, baseball. So random game here. Um, if you've got, if this is the situation, um, it's the bottom of the 11th. This is an important game. We have the bases are loaded. There are no outs. What do you do? What kind of pitch do you throw? Do you try to, if you, you know, if you're on the um, defense, what kind of um, do you try to steal? Um, if you're on the offense, all sorts of questions that arise just from this one scenario. Now think about all the possible scenarios that can arise, different innings, if it's the top, if it's the bottom, different bases that can be, um, people can be on different bases, um, you know, so many different scenarios. Um, and this, so this is just one situation. These are the kinds of things that we look at. So the sports analysts very often are industrial and systems engineers. Next slide. So we are now working with the Philadelphia Phillies. 
Um, they have a very large, like, like every sports team has a very large quantitative analysis department. And um, while I can't tell you exactly what we're looking on at, um, there are so many different scenarios, right? So for every possible scenario you can think of that could potentially happen in a baseball game, what should they do? Um, you know, and you think about who they're playing even and the strength of the team that they're playing or the strength of even the pitcher, um, the speed of the runners, the strength of the arm, their arm, the pitching arm, um, how many outs there are. So it's so many different scenarios. And so we're working with the Philadelphia Phillies. We're actually on our second project now with them, um, trying to help them best, make the best decisions. And you can't have you can't have a computer on the field there. You have to, so you have to make them into, make your analysis then into something that is actually practical and usable. Okay, so that's sports. Next slide. Transportation. This is um, a very big field for industrial and systems engineers. In fact, one of my students just told me yesterday that he was already offered a summer internship uh, with Burlington Northern Santa Fe, uh, which is a big freight railroad company um, west of the Mississippi and working in transportation engineering. And so very often they are industrial and systems engineers, all sorts of transportation possibilities from you know cars to trains to planes, um, trucks, roadway, um, lots of different um, potentials for ISCs. And in fact, um, he had also had another that, that same student had another um, offer from Amtrak, which is on here um, as well, also in their uh, systems engineering, uh, industrial and systems engineering department. But let me tell you about a project that we're working on. So next slide. So if you are familiar with Philadelphia, I don't know if any of you are from Philly, um, but in Philadelphia, we have, we have a couple of rivers. Um, we have a lot of bridges. And in fact, there are 1,225 bridges to be exact, uh, spanning a lot of feet, right? Almost five feet, uh, five miles there with a lot of traffic. And that's just car traffic. That doesn't count pedestrian traffic. Um, and so bridges, if you've ever looked at some bridges and all different kinds of bridges, you know, from the big bridges that maybe go from state to state to even the little bridges that maybe you go over a creek or maybe they're just a train bridge um, in a park, potentially it could be a, a bridge in a park, um, lots and lots of bridges. And so if you've ever taken a look at bridges anywhere in the country, many of them are not in the best of shape. And so that poses a big strain for departments of transportation all over the country. Next slide. So we're looking at bridges in particular. Um, and if you think about a bridge, you've got a substructure. It's, it's, bridges are broken out into three parts. You've got this substructure, you've got, which is really, if you think about it as a foundation, um, then you've got the superstructure, which sits on top of it. So it's really um, the metal uh, before you would pave it, the, the, um, the roadway before it's paved. Um, so the rest of the frame, basically the frame of the bridge if you will, and then the decking, which is really the roadway that gets put on top. And they analyze each of them for their condition. And so this is uh, recent data from the city of Philadelphia. And if you look here, um, you know, we have um, poor, serious, fair conditions. And for the substructure, the superstructure and the deck structure, there is a large percentage of our bridges that have fair, serious, or poor conditions. And so um, this, this is a lot of work for the Department of Transportation. It also costs a lot of money to fix all this stuff. And it has a certain lifespan. So you might fix it now, and then you know, in five, seven years, you're gonna have to fix it again. Also, these parts interact. So this has to do with systems engineering now. Um, because these are, these are really three subsystems, but they interact with each other. If you, if you do something to a substructure, you very well are going to change the condition of the superstructure for, for better or for worse, it depends on what you're doing. Um, you might improve it, but you also might make it worse. So there's some system interactions that we have to look at there as well. 
So it's not really as cut and dry as it looks. So this is a really hard problem. Next slide. So we have all of these bridges, all of these projects that we want to get fixed, but a very limited budget. Maybe not as limited as, um, a, a lot more limited, I should say, as the sports teams. Um, you know, they're on a very tight budget and they have a lot of work they want to get done. Um, but the problem is different parts of the bridge and different bridges have different life cycles because if a pavement project say lasts um, for five years on a bridge that goes state to state that's very heavily traveled, think about um, you know, a very small bridge in a rural area that you know, maybe doesn't get very many cars a day. So that's gonna have a different life cycle. And like I said, there are a lot of interactions between different parts of the bridge. So you can fix one part of the bridge, but you could actually, in, at the same time, damage another part of the bridge. And not only that, they look at it over a 25 year planning cycle, which is some things will have to be done multiple times. So uh, we started working with the, Depart the Pennsylvania Department of Trans Transportation. And we're looking to try to figure out when they should do each project so that we maximize the life cycle. So you're, you're kind of hearing a theme here, we're trying to maximize things. So optimization is a really big part of this. But the problem with this is that there are so many competing issues here. We have not just a budget issue, um, we have these system interaction issues. Um, we have life cycle issues. And then we have um, different parts of the state which have different budgets, but then there's an overall budget. And then there's this other issue. And that is, we're just looking at bridges. The Department of Transportation has an overall budget. And that includes the bridges, the tunnels, the roadways, anything transportation that the Department of Transportation touches, that's all under this one budget. And if you fix one thing, let's just say you fix a roadway. So now more people are gonna go down that roadway because there's a lot less potholes and, um, or maybe they widened it and it's, it's a lot easier to travel. Now people are gonna go over that bridge even more, right? So there's all these interactions and that's gonna change the life cycle of that bridge. So there's all these interactions. So this is an extremely hard problem we've been working on with the DOT um, for almost about eight months now, trying to help them figure this out. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry, that's it. you have to go back one. I thought there was one more slide. So we've been working with the DOT, um, trying to figure out how and how they should plan the next 25 years. So it's a, it's a very large project, um, one that is not going to get done right now, right away. Um, in fact, we're looking at first, we kind of come up with a methodology for bridges, then we were incorporating bridges and roadways, and then we're going to go, we're going to expand into tunnels because it's such a large problem that you can't potentially, you can't do it all at once. Okay, so that's a, a transportation example. Now we'll go into manufacturing. So manufacturing. So if I said to you, what are you, or you, you thought about industrial engineering, you probably would have thought about manu manufacturing. And in fact, I can tell you that of all the students I've seen graduate, I would say maybe, maybe 25% of them end up going into manufacturing. Very few, it might even be less very few really end up in manufacturing. Most industrial and systems engineers end up in some sort of um, more of a service oriented, like a sports or like um, a transportation, some sort of um, field like that. But manufacturing is where it all started. That is where industrial and systems engineers started. Um, back in the day, they would stand on a shop floor, they would have a stopwatch and they would do time studies. And uh, they would say, okay, you know, that it, this is supposed to take you 5.7 minutes to get done and you're doing it in 6.1. So you need to speed it up. And nobody liked us. Um, nowadays, we don't really do that. Um, thankfully, we have a lot of robotic equipment that does, we don't have a lot of manual assembly anymore anyway. Um, but manufacturing is real, where it all started. So let me give you an example of a manufacturing project I did. 
Next slide. So I was working with a manufacturer who made uh, roofing screws. And the problem that they were having in the field was that they were corroding a lot faster. So they get coated because they're gonna be exposed to the weather. So they get, they get a coating so that uh, it stops them from corroding. And um, they were getting complaints that the, these fasteners were corroding a lot faster. And then that's bad because then um, that corrode, that uh, causes the roof uh, to degrade and it just causes all sorts of problems. And so what they noticed was that the thickness of this coating was not uniform. So that was an issue. That's not really what the root cause was. So one of the things that ISCs do is try to determine what a root cause is of any issue. Um, and so we were brought in to, to take a look at this process and figure out why this coding was not uniform. So next slide. Oh, okay, we have to go back one slide, sorry. So we were brought in and we took a look at this process, really interesting process to try to, to see how um, screws were made. And what we, what we determined was not really that the coating wasn't thick enough. It had to do with, it, it turned out the coating itself was fine. The way the coating was being put on was fine. It had to do with the way that it was drying and it was only drying one side of it essentially of each screw. And so the, when it dried, instead of drying uniformly and evaporating what needed to be evaporated uniformly, it didn't. And so that's why um, there were parts of screws that were much thicker than the other parts of the screws. And so um, we ended up coming up, so then we remanufacture it. We remanufacture the way this drying process takes place um, which goes into some of the um, process redesign that you'd learn. And um, turns out we were able to help them um, get a more uniform coating on, their, on the screws. All right, so those were some examples from transportation, from healthcare, from manufacturing, from sports, very diverse fields. But that's what I love about systems engineering and industrial engineering is that you can work in all of these fields. Any field you really are interested in, you can take this ISC degree and go work in it. Okay, next slide. So um, what do we do in general? Now, if I had told you this at first, you'd say, okay, so what does that even mean? We create value, right? We don't necessarily make a product. We make products better. That, in fact, that was one of my favorite things. One of my organizations, the professional organizations I belong to, that used to be kind of their motto. We don't make things, we make things better. Uh, so we create value for organizations. We look at complex systems. So, I mean, healthcare, sports, they're very complex. All those problems, transportation that I talked about, those were very complex systems. It's not like, oh, here's a quick fix. It's a very complex system because of all the interactions. But if you think about all the different um, parts of an organization that you have to deal with to solve these problems, you need to have some business skills. So we do have some business in the degree, um, but you need to know what you're talking about. You need to have, you need to be able to analyze things with that engineering background. And so you need to have the technical acumen, but we combine that with some business skills. And we do that and we determine the most effective way to optimize these systems, these very complex systems. Okay, so that's what we do in a nutshell, much easier to explain it in terms of um, the application. Next slide. So what kind of skills do you need? Well, as a basis, you need your engineering, you need your math skills. And I purposely pulled out statistics here because statistics, yes, it's a math field, but it is the foundation of ISC. So sometimes people call ISC as an, an applied math field, um, maybe, but it's not just math based because you have to have, um, you need to have the technical skills, the engineering skills as well to be able to even understand what the system looks like. Um, so we have all those, but then because as this sort of problem solver and this optimizer, 
you need to be able to interact with different people in the organization and you need to be able to provide to very often management what the problem is. You don't necessarily have to tell them how to solve it, or at least not upfront, um, but you need to be able to tell them what the problem is and you need to be able to do it in a way that is um, with good communication, right? You need to have some interpersonal skills. Um, so we do, we do a lot of group projects. I'm sure Claire will be happy to tell you about them. We do lots of group projects. Um, we do lots of communication. So you have to um, give presentations. Uh, you know, that's a large part of what we do because as an, an ISE in particular, you have to be able to communicate with all different people, all different levels in an organization. You have to have some creativity. Right, because you have to be able to come up with some solutions. So there's a little bit of design. If you want to come up with a solution, there's a little bit of design involved. Certainly have to be able to problem solve and um, think on your feet, critical thinking. Those are all the, these are the, if you can master all these skills, you would be the best ISC ever. Next slide. All right, so what exactly do you learn? What kind of courses are you going to take? Next slide. So as I said, um, we have both ISC courses and we have a couple of business courses as well. And some of them overlap a little bit. So your main engineering courses, you'll take a couple of systems engineering focused courses. And those are the systems thinking and the systems engineering process, which um, systems engineering itself came out of defense from the 50s. Um, it has since grown and is now being accepted in any field. Um, but you have to learn the basic process. But all of what we do is based on this systems thinking. You have to have this sort of um, large scale, broad perspective, right? So to be able to think about a system and not be very focused. Um, so, but then you'll also take courses in quality. You'll take courses in how to design facilities, um, simulation. These are all, if you think about it, these are all tools. Facility planning, if you think about that, I didn't say, you know, it's manufacturing planning. It's how to, how to um, best optimize a facility layout. And so it could be any kind of facility. I don't care if it's an emergency room. I don't care if it's a sports stadium. Um, but how you best plan a facility. Um, we do do some a couple of courses specifically in production. Um, as I said, statistics is a big part of what we do and you will take your statistics courses in the engineering school. And uh, simulation, you could simulate any sort of system, right? So it's, it's applicable. So it's another tool that you're gonna put in your toolbox. Operations research, you take that in the ISC uh, department and program, and, but it has some elements of business with it. Um, you'll take an operations management course, which is in the business school. You'll take a finance course because you have to understand, you know, you don't want to come up with some pie in the sky design that's going to be completely, um, you know, financially unaffordable for the organization, right? So you have to have some, some idea of finance and financial skills um, and supply chain management. That's another big area, huge area for um, industrial and systems engineers. So these are the kinds of courses that you're going to take. And you'll of course have the opportunity to take some electives as well. Um, but these, all, these tools will all go into, basically I like to think about it as a toolbox. And by the time you graduate with your ISD degree, you have all these tools and you can take them and you can go work in whatever field is really interesting to you. And I, I really encourage you to um, think about what field interests you and then even potentially to try to get some internships. This might be two very diverse fields that you're interested in. Um, try to go get some internships and um, over you know a couple of different summers maybe and um, get some experience, see what you like, see what you don't like and, and you know kind of test the waters that way. I think that's a great way um, to do it. And there are tons and tons of internships for ISDs. In fact, I, are, I know of um, at least two, two or three 
at this point, students that already have secured summer internships. Um, so, and it's only November. So um, I really do encourage them to, and you to go get uh, those internships because they are out there and they are available. Okay, um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about the program. Um, feel free to contact me anytime. I'll be happy to talk to you about ISC. Great, thanks Dr. Jasmalski. Um, so I just wanna conclude with here are the contact information where you can um, just send any general inquiries, myself, Dr. Jasmalski, as well as Claire. But now um, while you're getting your questions ready, I'm gonna turn it over to Claire, who's gonna talk a little bit about what it's like to be a student at Temple Engineering and in the ISC major. But if you do have questions, you're gonna put those in the Q&A section of the Zoom. So if you hover your mouse over um, the Zoom controls, you should see that um, pop-up window come up. So any questions you have, feel free to type them in there. But without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Claire. Hi guys, I'm Claire. I'm a sophomore ISC student. And I actually originally came to Temple wanting to be an environmental engineer and ended up switching to industrial because of many ways that Dr. D was stating where it's such a flexible like career path and it's a really good mix of business and engineering, which was definitely more the way I learn. Whereas when I decided to switch from environmental, it was very science and engineering and I just didn't do very well with that. And I found that this is a much better path for me. Um, I'm involved in SWE and IISE, which is the Society of Women's Engineers. I'm actually the secretary of that club and the Industrial, Industrial and Systems Engineering Club. So even if you're not sure what uh, kind of engineering you would wanna go into, you could 100% go in undecided and join these clubs and learn more about them and see how they work. And it's so easy to be able to switch between them in the beginning. I definitely was able to do that on my own. And Claire brings up a good point that I forgot to mention is that the first year of our um, curriculum is basically identical for no matter what engineering major you want to go into. So the first two courses that you'll take in the fall semester and then, in this, and then in the spring semester, you'll take intro to engineering and then intro to engineering problem solving. You'll really get a taste of all of the engineering majors within those two courses. So if, like Claire said, she came in as an environmental engineer, but then discovered industrial and systems engineering. And you may come in, you know, as mechanical and then find out you like industrial and systems engineering. So um, we keep it that way because we do find that a lot of our students do end up changing their minds along the way because engineering is so broad and so vast that you want to be exposed to all those options before you officially declare your major. And you really don't get into taking um, your major specific courses until you're uh, maybe a first or second semester sophomore. So you absolutely have that time to figure that out. Claire, can you um, talk a little bit about what you might be involved in outside of the College of Engineering, like maybe a little bit about, you know, Temple as a whole? Yeah, totally. So I actually chose Temple because it was in the city and it wasn't too far from my home. I'm only about an hour outside. And I just knew that being in the city would be such a cool experience that I'd never had before growing up in the suburbs. I know I'm just a subway away from so many different things. I love thrifting with my friends. I love going and exploring new restaurants and all this kind of stuff. And I know COVID kind of put a damper on that, but we're on the come up. We're, Temple's fighting it. We're doing a good job. Um, I love it. I just got a new apartment. That's really exciting for next semester. Going back um, when we got, when Temple had to leave the campus, last semester I came home. So the opportunity to go back, I'm definitely excited about it. And um, Dr. Drzmalski mentioned this real quickly, but one thing I forgot to mention again is um, the, ab the ability to do summer internships is really important. Um, it's not like if you're looking at, um, for example, like Drexel University, which is also in Philadelphia that requires a co-op they call it as part of their um, curriculum, we do not require co-ops, but we find the majority of our students prefer to do summer internships because a co-op will delay graduation. It'll take you about five years to graduate as opposed to four at Temple. And what we find is that our students who do summer internships, like the ones that um, Dr. Drzmalski mentioned, 
um, are, you know, every bit as successful in finding full-time jobs after graduation. And um, a large majority of the time, our students who do internships will oftentimes get hired, <clears throat> excuse me, um, by the organizations that they've done their, done their summer internships with. And you can even um, segue that into part-time work over, um, over the school year, and then eventually, hopefully, full-time work um, when you graduate, you know, as an engineer. Now, um, for that we have not graduated any industrial and systems engineers yet. I believe our first, um, uh, Dr. Chesmalski, do you know when we may have our first graduates? So would that be 2020? So that'll be May of 22. So we have our oldest students are juniors right now. Um, so this is only our third year. Um, so you guys coming in would be our fourth class. Um, and that's when the first ones will graduate, May of 22. Yeah, exactly. And similar to our other engineering students, um, our overall statistics from last year, we don't have our graduate exit survey from um, the class of 2020 yet. That'll be available probably in, um, in January or February, but um, about 90% of our students um, six months after graduation are either working full time or they're in graduate school, whether that's, um, you know, a PhD program or, you know, a master's program, some other type of program, but um, our students are very successful in securing employment and engineering and industrial systems engineering in particular because it you know combines so many different fields it's one of those degrees that's always going to be in demand especially given the state of um, you know what we're going through right now a lot of what's going on right now is relying on you know engineering and industrial and systems engineering And again, if you have questions, you can type them in the Q&A um, option on Zoom. You'll just hover your mouse over and then type whatever questions that you might have. Um, if there's any parents joining us as well, please feel free to ask questions. We're happy to, to answer any of those. Um, one thing I want to mention as well, um, we are not offering them yet at the College of Engineering. We're still waiting on um, sort of feedback from the university's return to campus team. But the Office of Undergraduate Admissions is offering on-campus tours on a limited basis. There's obviously, um, you know, certain safety precautions that need to um, be taken into uh, to play by visitors. But if you are interested and have not yet visited Temple's campus, that option is now available. Um, and they're offering tours Monday through Saturday. Um, again, there's going to be um, registration limits and you'll need to wear a mask and observe social distancing. Um, procedures and the majority of the tour is going to be outdoors um, as per health guidelines, but it is um, available to visit Temple's campus if you're if you're able to do so, which we hope you are. And if you haven't done so already, on our website, which is engineering.temple.edu, we also have a virtual tour available there if you're interested in seeing a little bit more of our facilities. And then um, our YouTube channel, if you do a search for Temple College of Engineering um, on youtube.com, you'll be able to see um, a number of different videos just about um, some of our student organizations, some events on campus and some events at the college. So just another great way to interact with us and you know, kind of see us virtually um, until we can get back to campus and until things return somewhat normal, whatever that, whatever that might be. And since there aren't any questions, I'm guessing that means we answered everything. Um, so at this point, I'm going to stop the recording, but um, again, we'll follow up with how to access this. It'll be posted on our website probably within the next few days or so. So if you ever need to reference back to it, that is available. Um, but um, myself, um, Claire and Dr. Jasmalski can hang out for a few minutes if there's any outstanding questions. And again, you can type those in the Q&A portion, but I wanna thank everyone for participating tonight. I hope you found this helpful. And hopefully we'll see you on campus um, next fall, if not sooner. So thanks again, everyone, and good luck to you all. And again, we'll stay on if there's any additional questions.